You heard two amazing pieces tonight. That's what we're looking for. So send us some. You're all writers, right? We'd love to have it. Uh, we're going to finish up tonight with Frank Poole, who was kind enough to come here the night we weren't here. And oh. Facebook messed up our, oh. our ad. We drove all the way here, and we weren't here. So thanks for coming back. Everybody, including Malvern, it is a great bookshop. It does have my book on the shelf. Oh. Go down the piece, and when you get the poke, back up. <laughs> uh, the first poem I'm going to read today is the one in the Ocotillo Review, and um, I'll explain the title because it's a work I didn't know. The title is Debitage. Anybody happen to know that one? Good. Um, Backstory, uh, some months ago I went to the Galt site, which is an archaeological site up near Florence and Waco, and people have been camping out on the I-35 corridor for um, 16,000 years, and um, uh, perhaps you've heard of the Clovis culture that has spread over much of uh, North America 13,500 years ago. Well, the Galt site uh, has a layer below the Clovis layer. There were people uh, living here in, in Central Texas. Uh, they may have been the same people, but it was a different culture at any rate. So I got to talking to archaeologists and ended up, ended up spending a day in San Marcos, and I learned a new word. Uh, what, a lot of what they do is they, they work with debitage. Uh, you can see a beautiful Clovis point, and they're interested in that, but they're also interested in the little flakes and all the stuff that's left behind that tells them how they made that stuff and what was their technique and all this. So that's the title of my poem, and it has an epigraph by Marianne Moore, Omissions Are Not Accidents. A wheel, a pot, the point of a spear, Shaving and pinching and flaking leaves a legacy of removals. The fibers that never found the loom make their way into the shroud of Turin as floating discards. The bits overstruck from the chert by Ice Age hunters sit in plastic bins in a lab somewhere, and the specialists know all about refuse and middens and debitage and all the means of reduction. I know I've lived that trash. I know a couple of times who was the discarded plague. <laughs> As you, many of you probably know, Mary Oliver died a few weeks ago. And uh, my sister posted something on Facebook uh, I mourn all the poems Mary Oliver won't write, and Mary certainly had a, um, a, a following among people who don't read a whole lot of poetry as well. She was uh, one of the, our popular American poets. So I said something like, well, you know, take a walk in the woods and just try your hand at a Mary Oliver poem. So I tried my hand at a Mary Oliver poem, and the poem resisted. Uh, in terms of, well, it does have nature, and it does have uh, a reflection on nature, uh, but uh, it absolutely insisted on rhyming. I see the raven fall like lightning. It was high above the Yellowstone at a picnic spot, sitting on a wall, the raven watching me alone, preparing for a fall. He walked in lucid arrogance, his beak and pinions black, flashed a casual, empty glance, nonchalantly turned his back. His leap into the canyon was a jump from grace into an aerial abyss. I sensed suicide, my heart pumped as he fell furled in nihilist bliss, finally extending his wings to glide past wicked rapids and foam, from rim to the canyon's other side, out and back again, at home. He recovered. I saw him soar and climb 
where I could not follow, but for all that, his plummet tore my startled spirit hollow. When will I again know such a leap, made years ago, that still I trace? A plunge that vexes still my sleep in all its fallen grace. Back to Marianne Moore, uh, sort of a, a shout out. Um, I have a bad habit sometimes when poetry is formal, it, it just tracing out the rhymes and the meters and all that, and sometimes the meaning is like the third thing that comes to me. So I wrote this poem called Prosody. I too hate it. the constant count, the sampling scan, the ear opening back behind words to breaths and silences in the beat, the beat, the beat, the beat, metered and pounded, dancing in the feet, free or bounded, in the patterns that syllables repeat. And all that variation and coming back sometimes distracts me, abstracts away the voice's consummation. I too hate it when I fiddle with the riddles before I even lick and taste the poet. <laughs> This one was in the um, uh, uh, Texas Poetry Calendar. Uh, true story, uh, my buddy Evan and I watched the presidential election uh, of, 19, of 2004 when we thought all afternoon that George Bush was gonna be a one-term president. And we watched it on TV and I remember leaving. Uh, so some years later, I decided I'm not gonna watch TV anymore. I went up to Enchanted Rock. This is called Election Night on Enchanted Rock. The choosing continues, but I have fled from all but stars and the planet, feeling the billion-year-old baffleth below, watching the slow roll of the heavens as I ponder time and change and what will be. Lying on my back, I see airliners plying their silent ways westward Satellites glinting in the sunlight that still obtains far above as the darkness gathers on the granite beneath me. Past sundown and the lights of Lano glow in the north and a warm November west wind pushes soft and steady above the vernal pools as I gaze at dimming clouds and emerging stars. A single sotol sways behind me in the wind. I arise to make the descent in the dark. Though I can see the campground lights, I lose the path and stumble toward the future. <laughs> Philosophy with a rock hammer. Mostly have to pick, bursting the crust to break it free, to poke around edges to find the true mass, and right at the middle you split it across, something to redeem the day. Sometimes it's blunt force you need against a false face, as you see the matter wholly shatter in the noonday sun until the ghost level comes up to the light from laminated, lapsed sediments. You make small cuts near the big cuts, scourged by water or else by the works and days of men. You note the faults in everything, corrosives laid close away in the tool bay. The flake, the cob, the shard of what was left behind, indexes to the obscure destinies of those who came unto this site. You are not the first to sit here in the sun. Walking reed, walking reed, I'm but a stick. I read ranges and the salt beds of lakes long gone, yet can't help but yelp as cold flowing water restores sore souls. <laughs> and lastly, a two-part poem, uh, the first half of which I did not write. It was written by um, uh, the mother of a friend of mine named Georgia Jenkins, and I read it with her permission, and then I have a reply to it. Her poem, The Grammarian. 
to his love. The past is imperfect, the present conditional. You and I, my sweet, must live in the present tense. <laughs> and I replied, the maid to the grammarian, your constant parsing makes me tense. I cannot agree in number or sense. My person you have ardently wooed, but I am not in the indicative mood. <laughs> <laughs>